So I don't know about you, but I was screaming, Billy, get out of the house at the top of my lungs as I read this piece. Don't run upstairs. Go out the front door. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's talk about the foreshadowing on the wall and what gives us that creepy feel and what is ultimately a very instructive piece of literature today. Yeah, let's get into it. All right. Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I am... Crypto? You're my land, Crypto. Yeah. All right, we are going into heavy detail on The Landlady by Roald Dahl today. And if you are new to this channel, we go heavy into detail, pulling out a lot of the interpretations and meanings and symbols behind it. If you are down for that type of a discussion, hit that subscribe button. So we start off with publication information, and we'll leave a link in the description below where you can read this for free at teachingenglish.org. And this was published in 1959 in The New Yorker. So whether you're using the Flesh Kincaid or the Lexile, I mean, whatever way you want to rank this, this is actually very... Very good for younger students. It's actually ranked below Harry Potter in terms of difficulty. I would say, though, that this has a lot of good teachable moments as we're going to go through. Now, in terms of themes, I think there's the things aren't always what they seem. Yep, exactly. And we have also have trusting your instincts with this one, which is what I'm yelling at Billy for. <laughs> <laughs> which he does not listen to his instincts, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll talk about maybe why that is as well. All right, so let's go through the plot, and then we'll go into our breakdown to talk about what were some of the techniques Dahl used to give you some of those feelings where you're like, oh, Billy, you need to get out of that house right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in terms of plot, 17-year-old Billy Weaver travels from London to Bath on a business trip. What's his name? W-E-A-V-E-R, Billy. <laughs> Now, upon arriving, Billy finds it's late and he needs a place to stay. The train porter recommends for Billy to stay at the Bell and Dragon. However, Billy is distracted, darn kids, by the bed and breakfast sign. Squirrel. Billy decides to stay the night at the bed and breakfast place, and the landlady acts very hospitable. The landlady has Billy drink tea, which tastes like almonds. Hmm. (laughs) And Billy starts to notice that there are no other guests, and he learns that the landlady had an obsession with taxidermy. Dun, dun, dun. Billy sips his tea and finds the names of the guests spaced out by years and young men similar to him. And he soon has an ominous feeling as the landlady has him sign the book and talks to him about taxidermy and drinking tea. (laughs) <laughs> end story which is great yeah. i love the ending there yeah just kind of kind of gets a little sleepy why don't you why don't you rest your head down little billy I love this <laughs> sweet sweet little landlady take care of you right <laughs> oh yes she's gonna take care of him all right all right so for analysis let's look at this more from like a writing perspective right or, or from a teacher's perspective of of how do you look at a piece and have this feeling of oh billy get out of that house And translate that into how did the writer make you feel that, right? And I think he does some good uh, juxtaposition here at the beginning of the story to do that. So the opening lines talk about a peaceful, clear, starry sky and slow afternoon train ride. And this is where you have that juxtaposition of, but the air was deadly cold and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheek. What does but do in terms of a sentence, Crypto? It takes everything away before it and makes it null and void. Pretty much, pretty much. The idea is that, yeah, everything is peaceful, but the air is deadly is what you need to be paying attention to from a foreshadowing perspective. So nothing is actually peaceful then. So Dahl actually does this really cool technique where he is very repetitive in the beginning when he really wants to draw your attention. He he writes for a younger audience and he wants to draw your attention, even in a more mature piece, to a specific thing. So here we have a word that's repeated four times. Did you pick up on that, Mr. Crypto? Yeah, that's going to be brisk. And we have the quote from the story. He walked briskly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly these days. Briskness, he had decided, was the one common characteristic of all successful businessmen. The big shots up at the head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. And this foreshadows kind of the main idea that Billy is too brisk in his decision as to where to stay. He is hearing things uh, his instincts tell him to get out but he's too quick to make the snap judgment of just staying there so what does billy see upon entering the bed and breakfast place we have the the phrase is brilliantly illuminated a bright fire burning in the hearth on the carpet in front of a fire a pretty little dachshund was curled up asleep with its nose tucked in its belly plump armchairs like just very inviting words and imagery yes that definitely and it makes you feel all cozy inside but 
there's that but if for some reason you're not actually feeling that way for billy where all of a sudden he was in the act of stepping back and turning away from the window when all at once his eye was caught and held in the most peculiar manner by the small notice that was there bed and breakfast it said bed and breakfast bed and breakfast bed and breakfast <laughs> used four <laughs> times just like the word briskly right yep so can you say this is a mystical element to the story sure it can also just be kind of described as fatalistic where billy had no choice but to move forward in a particular path here we have some things that are unexpected that you really want to pay attention to as billy has made his very brisk decision the landlady is their lickety split basically she was maybe standing right behind the door knowing that he was going to come in um and, and you see these things come really quickly at you and be like wait a minute that doesn't feel right something is off almost like a predator ready to pounce on a prey and we have some juxtaposition in the language too here just like earlier where we describe her as she seemed terribly nice right terribly you can use that with nice but it's also a negative connotation too Doll's going to use that play on words and using negative and things that seem off throughout the story to kind of make you start to feel something under under the covers. And the next thing you'll notice is that the house itself seemed almost too perfect. There were no other people there. There were no other uh, items that made it feel real homey, even though it seemed to paint this picture of hominess. There's no coats. There's no jackets. There's no umbrellas. It, it feels very barren or stale we should assume at this point that there's no other guests there as well yeah and then when they start having the conversation she's all like oh there is a couple of boys i'm very cheesy in who i let in and that should be some alarm bells going off and uh do you remember what flower she had over over when you were first entered yeah it was the one that you always mention of it has a specific meaning uh i, I never say it right it's the chrysanthemums yellow chrysanthemums do you remember what do you remember what those are used for? Covering up smells or something? Mm. You've told me. Mm, let's keep going. Maybe maybe I don't want to be too brisk in giving you the answer here. <laughs> <laughs> so she asks him to go downstairs and make sure you sign that book. Don't go to bed without signing that book. I need you signing that book, little Billy. And uh, we have a quote, everyone has to do that because it's the law of the land and we don't want to go breaking any laws at this stage in the proceedings, do we? <laughs> we do not. I, I like the usage of this stage. Like, there's there's a stage we're supposed to break the law in, in this proceeding. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, well, and then also the word proceeding, uh, pr a procession. Why would we describe, you know, the process as a proceeding or a procession? Gosh, uh, if only... Funeral-esque procession. If only I can think of what flowers go with a funeral procession. <gasps> Yellow chrysanthemums. Uh, there you have yeah, it. The little... There you go. <laughs> come here for floral analysis we'll, we'll do it for you every time <laughs> right <laughs> you love your flowers yeah i mean there's little hints hidden throughout all the way through the story and and even though they hadn't really talked about the taxidermy up to this point in the story the dog and, and a few other items in the house have lend themselves to heavy foreshadowing that she is probably the only person that's alive in in the house well, there's no coats, no umbrellas, no nothing to give you that hint, right? And even Billy knows something's kind of off. We have the quote from him where he says, Now that fact that this landlady appeared to be slightly off her rocker didn't worry Billy in the least. Really, Billy? <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe that's youth and optimism of looking positive at our elders. I don't know, but Billy kind of acted dumb here. Well, you have to remember, Billy is our narrator, right? So, so the naivety of the story is through a young 17 year old boy where even in these lines that you can kind of just really read over real quick when you think about from a writing perspective she was not only harmless there was no question about that well since billy's our narrator he has no question about it us as readers are much more intelligent and are like uh billy there's something off here buddy yeah there should have been alarm bells going off in his head the whole time okay so we've got imagery right we've got setting throwing things off now here's even some verb usages that should be putting some alarms in your head too like doll is really good at this but we have the quote i don't think they were famous but they were extraordinarily handsome both of them i can promise you that so notice the usage of past tense here they were handsome right and 
were, past tense can be used for a couple different reasons, right? If they were no longer here, right? If they were dead, <laughs> um, or if they were no longer handsome. Right? So which one of the three could it possibly be at this point in time? None of them good, no matter what they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then she goes on to describe them physically, right? In terms of how old they were, in terms of how tall they were. And we have the quote, this one, ooh, this is like a knife in my ears. There wasn't a blemish on his body. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Una, how would you know that there's not a blemish on anyone's entire body? Uh, you, I'm, you should be sitting here thinking, like, <laughs> either either she's got, like, peepholes all over the bathroom. <laughs> she, she went Norman Bates on him. <laughs> or she straight up murked this guy and, and is looking over his body, right? Mm. And we have the quote here about Billy's teeth actually having fillings. Any thoughts on that one? So I was a little bit confused about this at first, but then kind of realized that, again, to your point at the beginning, things are not what they seem. On the outside, everything looks perfect, rosy, and good. His teeth look great on the outside. The house looks great on the outside. It's different on the inside of his teeth. They're rotten, filled with fillings. Her house looks good on the outside, but it's rotten on the inside. Right, and also think about that from a knowledge perspective. He knows that his teeth are rotten on the inside. How would the landlady know that these guests are rotten on the inside? Because you don't really get to know someone if you're just stopping by for a night and, and renting a place and taking off, right? Like, exactly. This is, this is that insider information red flag that should be going off in your head. So at this point in the story, we finally get the reveal that the animals have been taxidermied by the landlady. And she says, I stuff all my little pets myself when they pass away. And... You, you you feel very ominous here at this point in time. At least I did. I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. This is going to go dark real quick mm -hmm. because I didn't know where the story was going at this point in time. But now I know it's going down that horror kind of avenue. And then also just with kind of like the book, couldn't when she says, I can never remember Mr. Mulholland's name, couldn't she just ask him? Why would she have to refer to the book unless he was no longer able to speak for some particular reason, too? Now tie that together with this taxidermy hint, <laughs> right? Yeah, his lips are sewn <laughs> shut. Ooh, <laughs> brutal. Well, and we had a quote very early on in this story. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this, Billy told himself. Well, now we have the things aren't always what they seem. There are no animals, which means that good luck feeling ought to be flying out that door. It, yeah, and, and all the animals are actually dead. Mm -hmm. Not not a sense of security, but should be the warning of death. Right. So I think the story cuts quick, right? Like when, particularly when you get into some heavier literature, I'll say people, people that like to discuss the meanings rather than just have it handed to them on a platter of this is what this means. This is approaching, particularly for such a younger audience, a way to invite discussion, right? And I think a lot of students will be like, so did she kill him? <laughs> right <laughs> well i think that's a great question because the the story is so open-ended you really don't know what happens to billy there's a lot of inferences of what you should think happens to him but i suppose you could make an argument that he gets to go away free probably not but so what do you think this story represents i think it represents the, the beginnings of the horror trope of uh almost like the witch inviting in hansel and gretel here that idea of the facade of the sweet old lady, but deep down she's evil. Mm -hmm. And just like Hansel and Gretel, we have very young protagonists coming in and making decisions way too quick, right? Trusting of other people, having instincts to say, oh, this isn't right, but pushing forward for some unknown reason. And I think that it goes to the fact of we should be leery of who we trust and that just because somebody is older doesn't mean necessarily that you should trust them. And you should trust your own instincts, regardless of what your eyes tell you. And arguably we had safety in public in the belt. Like that was a very specific line where they talked about safety and public as well as the landlady represents kind of the privacy. And we see some, there's some risks what come with the privacy as opposed to the public life too. There's some commentary on that as well. Yeah. And I love that, that here you kind of see the, the young boy is the country bumpkin. He's very trusting 
and he goes into the city and he doesn't worry about having the safety in numbers, you know, kind of that herd mentality, even though, I mean, we are animals and we're a herd species. We like having camaraderie and being together. He doesn't need that. He's like, oh, I can be one-on-one with this old lady. I'm going to trust her. It's going to be good. But in actuality, you are safer if there are more people around, because if there had been other guests there, he might not have been, you know, killed by her. Right. And this is the third Roald Dahl that we've done on this channel. I know you and I have read plenty of other Dahl besides this three, but in terms of coverage on this channel, this is our third one. And you'll notice all three of them have this theme of danger comes from unexpected places. Yeah, so the the lamb to the slaughter. We had the wife. Yeah, the hitchhiker. We had the, the guy that you expected to be the danger is actually the one that was helpful. So it kind of, once again, flipped it. On your, yeah. on your head. The cop was the bad guy and the hitchhiker was the good guy. And then here we have the nice old lady that turns out to be the, the Norman Bates serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, I don't know if you've seen it. There is a, um, you might have seen it. It's like called like the Tales of the Unexpected or something like that, particularly which goes with the theme of danger coming from unexpected places, uh, which I think was put on in the UK. And Roald Dahl himself actually narrated the intros. And then there's like a, a real life drama action re- reincarnation of the story they did this story and they took the story further where they show the two other guests actually being like dead and taxidermied and the old lady comes in and checks on them and stuff like that like it takes it to the next step where it takes out some of that discussion item of the short story mm, but it's kind of implied heavily that you know that that's where it's going right oh was doll supportive of that that's kind of cool i mean that takes a story and takes it to a different medium and makes it better, improves upon it, which we rarely see. Right. Well, I know he showed up and did the intros and talked about it. I have no idea if he had any control over the creative output. Well, I guess that takes us to our subjective literature analysis, looking at our different types of viewpoints of this story. And uh, I love this story. I love the twist at the end. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to give this one an 8.5 for enjoyment and uh, probably a little less 7.5 for literary analysis being that it's a little bit easier, but useful tool as well for, you know, younger students. Give it a solid eight overall. Bam. I'm going to go with an 8.5 for enjoyment. I was really on the edge of my seat for a little bit. (laughs) It was a lot of fun. Now I'm going to be a little bit harsher on the analysis because I, 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 I've been thinking about this because I agree it's a fantastic tool about foreshadowing and, and the juxtaposition of language, the juxtaposition of, of comfort and uh, the setting of the characters. Really, really good for, for uh, you know, a, a group that's trying to learn to read more critically, right? But outside of that, I don't know if it really touched on the edges of just really brilliant literary new ground. I think it just did everything really, really good and solid. So that makes it really hard to choose because a teaching tool is, is one thing and just a personal analytical rating is another thing. I'm going to go with a five on the analytical rating just because I'm going to go more on the side of this just didn't break new ground, but I agree as a tool, it's super fantastic. Oh, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I think that it really depends on the level of maybe students that were using this in a classroom, middle school kids, maybe give it a little bit higher, college kids, maybe give it a little bit lower. Right, right, right. Well, all right, guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. We post videos two to three times a week with literature discussions. Please consider hitting that subscribe button if you'd like to join us on the journey of, of walking through short stories and novels alike and talking about what they mean to us and getting more out of them. Una out. Peace.